Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Oh, I, I guess we're recording. Oh, is that what we're doing? Yes. I thought we've just been speaking at each other this whole time. This whole year we were just talking to one another. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's good to know that this is being recorded. It is, absolutely. Yeah. Welcome to Dark Poutine. My name is Mike Brown. I'm the creator and the host. With me as usual is my good friend and co-host, Scott Hemingway. People call me Poindexter. You are the herald to my red green. Yeah, I, I still don't really get it because I don't didn't watch much red green. Yeah, well, I'll take it as a compliment, no matter how it was intended. That'll be your homework is to watch some red green. I got lots of other shit to watch. I just like you I, just don't want to do any homework for this show. <laughs> I want to make millions of dollars having <laughs> never had to do homework. Okay. <laughs> I changed up our disclaimer a bit. Dark poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. The content and discussion in this podcast contain graphic and intense content. Mm. And often descriptions of violence and death. It would be a pretty boring true crime podcast without those. Well, listener discretion is strongly advised. Very. We're not experts on any of the topics we present, nor are we professional journalists. We're just two regular Canadians interested in crime and the darker side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque. Grab yourself a double-double and an Anaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Episode 40. Lordy, lordy, look who just turned 40. Yep, this podcast. Woo, woo. Thank you to our regular subscribers and welcome to our new listeners. We appreciate your filling your ears with our dark poutine. You have no idea how much we appreciate it. We are telling them how much. But I, I, I can't put it into words, Mike. It, it surpasses uh, description. Well, your vocabulary isn't very good. I resemble that. You used that correctly, so kudos to you, Scott. I'm squinting in your direction. You are squinting. This is a tough one. It involves the death of five children. Oh, no. And their parents. Okay, well, I'm going to go. Well, that that will be a drag for everybody. Okay, fine. Because they will just have to listen to me then talk about very horrible things. Fine, I'll stay. On the morning of Sunday... June 28th, 1959, RCMP made a grisly discovery in the garage adjacent to a small home in Stettler, Alberta. Raymond Cook, his wife Daisy May, and their five children, Gerald, nine, Patrick, eight, Christopher, seven, Kathy, five, and Linda May, three, were found dead and stuffed into a homemade grease pit. Oh, dear God. Robert Raymond Cook... Raymond Cook's troubled son from a previous marriage, out of prison for only days, had been arrested the day before for fraudulently trading his father's station wagon for a convertible. Well, convertibles aren't nice. I mean, there's that. Sure. As the gruesome details of the brutal crime emerged, Albertans and Canadians alike were horrified. Robert Raymond Cook, the sole remaining son, seemed to be the only viable suspect. Could a son and brother have committed such violence against his own family? Evidence pointed to yes, but others had their doubts. Hmm. Cook was held responsible for the crime, yet went to the gallows adamant that he was innocent and was not at all involved in the murders. Hmm. To this day, some speculate he may have been wrongly executed. 
This is the story of the Cook family massacre and Alberta's last man hanged. Well, I'm quite looking forward to this. What? <laughs> well, I mean, in the sense that uh, it this sounds like there's a lot to this. There is. There yeah. is. There are almost. Uh, well, there's almost 6,200 words to the script that I wrote. So. Oh my god. I know. I apologize. Much of the research for this episode came from several sources online. There's a lot of information about this. As well, three books and a film of note are Lee Meller's book, Rampage, Canadian Mass Murder and Spree Killing, a semi-fictional account called The Boy, which was written by Betty Jane Hegarat, and Barbara Smith's true crime anthology, Fatal Intentions, True Canadian Crime Stories, and the film was Rick Smallwood's thorough and impeccably researched, independently released, chilling documentary called The Grease Pit, the story of Robert Raymond Cook. How long ago was The Grease Pit made? It seems pretty recent. Okay. However, it's only available at the website robertcook.ca. I don't know if it's for sale anywhere else. I couldn't find it anywhere else. Oh, interesting. Okay. But Mr. Smallwood... Rick Smallwood, I'm speaking directly to you. I hope you find this uh, podcast and enjoy it. We loved your documentary, and I would love to see it on some place like Netflix or iTunes or Amazon so people can really enjoy it and you can make some money. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a documentary junkie. Me do want. We'll watch it together. Yeah, yeah. Now on to the story. On July 15, 1937, in Hannah, Alberta, Robert Raymond Cook was born to newlyweds Josephine 18, and her husband, Raymond, 28, a self-taught career mechanic. Hannah, Carol reminds me, was also the birthplace of much-beloved mustachioed Calgary flame star, Lanny McDonald. Oh, man, if you get, if, if listeners out there don't know who he is, Google him. He was one of my favorites. He's got a great red, bright red mustache, too. I met him when I was a kid. I got a photo taken with him, which I don't know where it is. But, yeah, I, and I don't I don't like the Calgary Flames, but I love Lanny McDonald. Yeah, Lanny was a great player. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wikipedia also told me that some of the members of Nickelback are from there as well. I guess they can't all be winners yeah i'm not i don't even like that's just too easy yeah to make fun of so low-hanging fruit low hang in which i'm usually prone to grab but raymond cook liked to drink and carouse with other women this caused josephine a lot of anger as she was stuck at home with the baby although their marriage was stormy all accounts are that the pair doted on their son bobby josephine was not a healthy person suffering from numerous ailments including heart problems when bobby was nine on September 16, 1946, Josephine died during an abdominal surgery to repair a volvulus, or a painfully twisted bowel causing an obstruction. Oh, no. Ray felt Bobby was too young to go to his mother's funeral and left him at home with a babysitter. Hmm. Bobby and Ray were alone. Ray had to play mother and father to his son and began to look for more female companionship to console him and help take care of his son. Ray also passed on his love of cars and fixing them to Bobby, who loved to watch his dad work. Ray also taught Bobby to drive when he was only 10 years old. I mean, entertaining, I'm sure, but I don't think I'd recommend doing that. Well, pretty much right away, Bobby began boosting local cars for high-speed joyrides. Oh my God, at 10? At 10. Jeez. It was easy as most people left their keys in their vehicles at the time then. I think even up into the 70s, lots of people did that. Some reports were that people would see a car speeding away with what appeared to be no one driving as the car thief could barely <laughs> see over the steering wheel. At 10, I was watching The Karate Kid and trying to do an ollie on my skateboard, which I never, I've never been able to. You've do. never mastered. No. At the same time, Ray had fallen for Daisy May Gasper, 10 years his junior. Daisy was Bobby's school teacher in grades 3 and 4, which is how the pair met and their relationship blossomed over chats of Bobby's poor behavior at school. Hmm. So Bobby was not at all keen with this relationship because she's tattling on him to dad. I think I can see where Bobby's coming from. Daisy also took a lot of his dad's attention away from him. Bobby had already lost his mom. Now he felt like he was losing Ray too. Hmm. Yeah, I can get that. Daisy and Ray, to Bobby's disappointment, were married in the summer of 1949. Daisy was no sickly Josephine. She was happy-go-lucky and had a great sense of humor. Ray was in love, and he started to settle down. In February of 1950, things got worse for Bobby. 
Daisy gave birth to her first son, Gerald, who was quickly dubbed Jerry. More attention was ripped away from the now resentful Bobby and given to his younger half-brother. Also that year, the family packed their things and moved to Stettler, about halfway between Edmonton and Calgary. Bobby didn't want to move. It meant leaving all his friends behind and having to start all over in a new town and a new school. To a kid, 126 kilometers seems a world away. Bobby was pissed off. Yeah, yeah, I, I moved around that time. I wasn't jazzed about it either, so I, was, I think as a kid, that's a pretty key key time in life. The family settled in a small clapboard bungalow with an adjacent garage where Ray could fix cars at 5018 52nd Street in Stettler, Alberta. I gotta ask, what's a clapboard bungalow? It's just a thrown-together bungalow. Okay, all right. Yeah. To top it all off, Daisy was pregnant again, this time with Patrick, later called Patty, born in 1951. He was quickly followed by Christopher, or Chrissy, in 1952. Bobby had begun to get himself into real trouble at 13. His favorite crimes were break and enter and car theft. As well, he taught himself how to get into a locked car and hotwire it so he could take his pals joyriding across the prairie. Yeah, not off to a great start. He was showing evidence of developing an antisocial personality. He lied when it suited him, especially if it meant getting away with something. Interestingly, he was not known to be violent and was really well liked. He actually kind of looked like James Dean. Like, seriously, I'm looking at a photo of him right now. Yeah, he was not a bad-looking guy. No. Hmm. At some point, Bobby found alcohol, too. That was like throwing gasoline on a fire that was already out of control. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Between 13 and 19, Bobby amassed 19 different convictions, mostly for automobile theft and B&Es. Holy shit. He spent time in various reformatories, jails, and finally Stony Mountain Penitentiary. Meanwhile, Daisy and Ray continued having children. Kathy was born in 1954, and Linda May was born in 1956, so now they had five. Wow. And five kids running around a, a tiny little bungalow left literally no room for Robert. Oh, I would imagine, yeah. In Stony Mountain, Bob, as he liked to call himself at that time, took up boxing and even considered a professional career when he got out. It wasn't that easy for this leopard to change the spots, though. Cook's freedom was short-lived. Mm. He quickly ended up in the Prince Albert Federal Penitentiary in Saskatchewan after more convictions for another stint in the clink. Mm. June 23, 1959, four days before the grizzly slayings, inmate 7185 Robert Raymond Cook, 21 years old, already a career criminal, gained his freedom from the Prince Albert pen, but it was not as he served his time. Hmm. Cook and several other prisoners in federal pens were released as part of an amnesty gesture by Queen Elizabeth II. Okay. She was in Canada with Prince Charles to see the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway. Okay. Prisoner amnesty was a traditional practice at the time for British monarchs visiting Commonwealth countries. Oh, okay. I, I wasn't aware of that. And neither was I until I read this. Cook and his prison buddy, Jimmy Myaluck who'd also been just released, dragged themselves from bar to bar in Saskatoon on the day of their release. And yeah. Drunk as skunks, the pair took a late-night bus to Edmonton, Maya Luck's hometown. On June 24th, early in the morning, the pair arrived in Edmonton, still pissed from the night before. Cook saw his buddy Maya Luck home, sharing a taxi, and then checked himself into room 44 of the commercial hotel. Quote, disheveled and quite drunk. Hmm. That afternoon, Cook went car shopping, eventually landing at Hood Motors. So you just got out of jail, so you're going to go car shopping? Was he actually, like, shopping? I'm skeptical that he had the funds to go and... Uh... There sat the car of his dreams. A brand new Chevrolet Impala convertible. Wait a minute, like the tattoo on my shoulder. That's right. It was white with red trim and lots of chrome. Quite a snazzy ride. Scott, you do like Impalas, right? It is my favorite car of all time, 1964 Chevy Impala SS two-door. This was a 1959 Chevy Impala. Oh, okay, so those were much more round. And Finney. Yes. Wide-eyed, Robert Cook told the salesman he had a station wagon to trade for the car, but had to go to Stettler to pick it up. Cook's alcoholic binge continued that evening with a gaggle of ex-con buddies at the beer parlor at the Selkirk Hotel. 
The party carried on to, into the next day, even after the beer parlor closed at another roadside motel with Cook paying half the cost of the $20 room. Somehow, Cook supplied the booze for the party. His friends didn't know where the money come from. Cook convinced his pal Eddie Reed to lend him his pickup truck so he could go and get the station wagon that he claimed his dad had waiting for him in Stettler. Reed agreed, sending Walter Berezowski along for the drive so he could bring the truck back to Edmonton. Hmm. They arrived in Stettler around noon, and Berezowski left an hour later, dropping Cook off downtown. Strangely, Robert Cook didn't call on his family to let them know he was home. He just wandered around downtown for the next eight hours. At 9 p.m., Ray Cook ran into his son by chance on Main Street, and he was surprised to see him. <laughs> I would imagine so. Before driving home, Robert and Ray went to the Royal Hotel for more beer. So everybody's pretty drunk. Yeah. Witnesses say this reunion looked friendly and comfortable for both. The brief time with his son in the hotel bar would be the last time anyone would see Ray Cook alive. Mm. I see where this is going. The next morning, as soon as Hood Motors opened back in Edmonton, there was Robert Raymond Cook. He was driving the station wagon he'd mentioned to the salesman, Len Amoroso. Hmm. Cook introduced himself as Raymond Cook, employed full-time as a diesel mechanic, saying he made $750 a month. He could put $90 down right now on the car and was willing to pay a whopping $100 per month on the car that he wanted so badly. 750 a month that, that in the late 50s, that's a chunk of change. It is. But also $100 a month for a car is a pretty huge chunk as well. Yes. Jimmy Mylock soon arrived at Hood Motors to keep his pal company during the sale. Amoroso noted the two seemed very tired, especially Cook, who sometimes took a moment or two to respond when called Raymond. <laughs> well, it's because it wasn't his name. Mm -hmm. It was a slow afternoon at Hood Motors, and Amoroso really wanted to make the sale. Perhaps that's how he overlooked the birth year on the driver's license handed to him by Cook. It was 1908. <laughs> Cook looked nowhere near 51 years old. And like from this picture here of him that we have. Nope. The license belonged to his father, whose wallet he also had with him. Around noon, Amoroso saw Cook and Maya Luck on their way, happily driving off in the new Impala. Mm. Amorosa didn't want to be bothered with completing the paperwork for that day, so that's what Saturdays were for, because they were even slower and they had even fewer customers. He had just made a lucrative sale, closing on one of the most expensive cars on the lot. Well, uh, good on you, Amorosa. On Saturday morning, Amorosa came in and picked up the papers for the Impala sale. He noticed that the buyer had not signed the insurance papers. <laughs> that beautiful new ride was uninsured and it would be a shame if something had happened to it. Hmm. Rather than drive all the way to Stettler and back to fix a small error, Amoroso picked up the phone and called the RCMP in Stettler. Oh, okay. <laughs> they agreed to pay Raymond Cook a visit and get things straightened out. Well, how great. Let's take a break here. If you're looking for a smoking gun, I can absolutely guarantee you, you will not find it. In October 2001, a series of letters filled with a deadly powder called anthrax were dropped into the U.S. mail system. What started as an unprecedented case turned into an unsettling mystery. Who sent these deadly letters and why? From Campside Media and Sony Music Entertainment, I'm Josh Dean, and this is Cover Up Season 4, The Anthrax Threat. Available now. Okay, let's carry on. RCMP officers drove by the Cook residence and noted there seemed to be no one home. Hmm. The Impala was spotted by RCMP Constable Braden later on on Stettler's Main Street, cruising up and down around 7 p.m. on Saturday night, presumably showing off that new ride. That, yeah, understandably. As he pulled the car over, he noticed a young man driving. This officer, new to the area, did not recognize the driver. When he asked the young man if he was Ray Cook, the driver said he was. Oh, well, there you go. 
The RCMP officer told Cook to follow him to the detachment. His sergeant wanted to meet with him. Cook complied. I see this ending well for Mr. Cook. Upon arriving at the detachment before heading inside, Constable Braden asked Cook if he could look in the trunk of the Impala. Hmm. In the Impala's trunk, Braden found two suitcases, a metal box, a garment bag, and loose pieces of clothing. It's a large trunk. Braden asked Cook where his parents were. Cook said, Montreal. After some more searching, Braden again asked Cook where his parents were. This time he said, Vancouver. They're, they're close enough. Braden briefed Sergeant Roach about the odd interaction and his findings before leaving for the day. Sergeant Roach, who was expecting to see Raymond Cook, was taken aback at first seeing the troublemaker Robert Cook. Mm. As far as he knew, Robert Cook was still in the clink in Saskatchewan. <laughs> Thank you, Queen. He asked him questions about his release and why he'd used his father's driver's license to acquire this new car. Cook began to spin his yarn. I bet he did. The story he laid out did not ring true with RCMP Sergeant Roach. I hope aliens were involved. <laughs> they weren't. Oh. Much of the dialogue from the following exchange was found in Barbara Smith's book, Fatal Intentions, True Crime Canadian Stories, in her story about the case, All in the Family. When asked where his father was, Cook went on a ramble about how Ray had purchased a garage in BC and the family had gone on ahead of him. He would be joining in a few days. When Roach asked, where in BC are they? Cook simply answered, they took the train. <laughs> That's a great city in Vancouver, by the way. Yeah, they took the train. Yeah. yeah, it's right beside New West. Yeah. Cook then claimed he'd driven them to Edmonton and dropped them at the train. At one point, he also claimed that he had driven them to Calgary so they could fly. Okay. All right. Well. Frustrated, Roach asked for more clarity. What town or city is the garage in? Again, Cook answered, oddly but calmly. Oh, sorry, Sergeant Roach. I see what you mean now. They didn't actually tell me exactly where they were heading, just that Dad bought a garage in B.C., and they'd call me once they'd settled. Yeah, because that's, that's how people communicate. Sure. You know, instead of like, if they knew, if he knew where he's going, he would say, we'll be in Burnaby. Right. Cook claimed his father gave him his ID so he'd have an easier time buying the new car. Telling Roach he would send the driver's license back right away. <laughs> That'll make up for it. <laughs> Roach wanted even more clarity. Did Ray know Robert was buying the car? Yeah, sure, Sergeant Roach. He even gave me his station wagon as a trade because, see... I gave him a bit of cash. I sort of tucked away a bit from my last job. Uh, Roach knew that he had never actually had an honest job, so... Yeah, which it just seems uh, like the right... Yeah. And he was also incredulous because Ray Cook was known to be an honest and moral guy who dealt fairly. Robert Cook's story was not adding up. Roach pressed Robert for more detail. Did Ray know he was using stolen cash to pay for his new business? <laughs> Robert said, Look, Sergeant, me and my dad both felt I'd paid for that money. He didn't feel bad taking it. I'd served my time for stealing it. Now it's mine to give. In exchange, he gave me the family car. Hmm. I'm an honest guy. I'm telling you about a crime that I committed a long time ago. You really get some healthy insight into this dude's thoughts and how his brain works. Or doesn't. Neither very well. Sergeant Roach was unwilling to accept Robert's fantastic story and arrested him and detained him for fraud for purchasing the car under false pretenses. Out for only four days, Robert was again behind bars. Unable to drive his new sweet Impala. Sergeant Roach then tasked his officers to go and have a look at the Cook residence on 52nd Street. His gut told him something was very wrong, especially after what Robert Raymond Cook had told both he and Braden, but he needed evidence. It was discovered that Ray Cook had not shown up for work on Friday, and no one had seen any of the Cook family on Friday or Saturday, or any time since. Jeez. Not known to police at the time, Robert would later claim he had spent about an hour at the Cook residence that day before cruising Main Street. This would be a big part of his defense, as he claimed he hadn't seen anything out of the ordinary when he was there. Mm. When RCMP arrived at 5108 52nd Street just before midnight, the house was quiet. No one came to the door when they knocked, and they didn't go inside at that time. Roach called his staff sergeant Beeching in Red Deer and told him the story seeking advice. 
Beeching told Roach to hold on to Cook and to search the house. There was enough probable cause to enter the premises at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Police entered the house around 12.30 a.m. Roach himself was leading the charge, and they began their search only by flashlight, and they were only in there for a few minutes. It was too dark to see much, just an odd jumble of clothes on the bed, but no sign of the cooks. Mm. They didn't want to disturb any evidence fumbling around in the dark, so they decided to wait until morning. Makes sense. At 11 a.m. on Sunday morning, a search group of eight RCMP officers arrived at the Cook home. Upon entering, they noticed Saturday's Calgary Herald laying on the sun porch floor. The fact that only Saturday's paper was there was curious. Mm -hmm. Where was Friday's paper if the family had gone on Thursday evening? Yeah, yeah, makes sense. I get it. A cursory look through the house showed nothing unusual except the clothes on the bed and the fact that all the beds had been stripped. Hmm. One officer looking closer, and here's where it's going to start to get graphic, folks, oh, okay. noticed a speck of what appeared to be blood and some sort of tissue on the TV near the door in the living room. Eesh. High up on the wall, about seven feet, was more blood with what turned out to be more tissue. He called it gristle. Oh. They knew something was very wrong now. Upon closer scrutiny in the master bedroom where Daisy and Ray slept along with the girls, Kathy and Linda, RCMP discovered a scene of grisly horror. Under the pile of clothing taken from the closet and dresser, the mattress to Daisy and Ray's bed was soaked in blood. Oh. Flesh, bits of bone, and what appeared to be brain. Oh, no. The pillows were amassed in gore. Wrapped up in the clothing was a side-by-side -side double barrel shotgun with a broken wooden stock and barrels bent in two places. Two spent Olympic brand number five shot shells were in the breech of the firearm. A blood-stained suit jacket was found under the upper left corner of the mattress. There were five more live shotgun shells in the pocket of the suit. The pants to match the jacket, also stained in blood, were found under the mattress further down. Sounds like a pretty horrific scene. So far, yeah. it gets worse. As well, there was a belt, a red tie, and a white dress shirt. All items except the shirt would later be tied to Robert Raymond Cook. The shirt, which became known as the Ross shirt, would later play a part in Cook's trial mm. and defense. Mm. The mattress where the girls slept in their parents' bedroom was also soaked in blood. Oh. In the back bedroom, where the Cook boys Jerry, Patty, and Chrissy slept, was also a horrible scene. There was a lot of blood soaked into both mattresses and blood spattered on the walls. It looked as though someone had made lame attempts at scrubbing the walls, but ended up smearing the blood around more. Ugh. It was plain to all that this was now a murder investigation. Where were the bodies? RCMP in Edmonton were sent to Hood Motors to check the station wagon and whether it showed any signs of blood or evidence of having carried bodies. Mm -hmm. It did not. There was a pickup park beside the house that was also cleared. There were no signs of recent holes being dug around the home. There was that garage, though, attached to the house where Ray was known to work on cars. Mm. The floor of the garage was dirty, oil-stained, and according to Rick Smallwood's documentary, covered in cardboard. The cardboard was removed, and that revealed a grease pit covered in wooden planks in the center of the floor. This looked to be the kind that mechanics would use to get under a car and work on it without having to jack it up. Yep. There was also red staining on the side of the cardboard that had faced the floor. <sighs> what was also evident on removal of the cardboard was the distinctive smell of death. Anyone who has smelled this unique smell cannot forget it. I too have smelled this a few times. The best way I can describe it is rotting meat, rotten cabbage, and a kind of sickly sweet underneath like sour milk. It takes days before it leaves your nostrils completely. Oh, I'm glad I haven't smelt that. The officers knew they were going to find human remains as they continued. Oh, poor guys. Removal of the planks revealed all sorts of detritus in the pit. Wheel rims, tires, and tire chains were what police saw first. Once the tires were removed, the legs of two different individuals were evident in the pit, covered by papers, garbage, and bloody bedclothes. Removal of the bedclothes revealed the face of the oldest of the cook girls, Kathy. She had been bludgeoned. Ugh. Ugh. Snapping photos as they went, police uncovered all five of the missing children and their two parents. It was clear, due to the trauma suffered by all seven bodies, and the cold method of disposal, that someone with a great deal of anger had committed this massacre of seven people, five of whom were innocent children, none older than nine years old and as young as three. Well, oh, that gets my goat. Oh. Due to the blood spatter and placement of other grisly bits of evidence, including her teeth, 
Investigators determined that Daisy had been shot in the head first while lying in bed. Good God. Ray had taken a shot from the first round in the chest as, as well as then being shot in the head with a second blast. A shotgun blast to the head is not a small wound. No. Like, this must have been such a horrific scene for these officers to be witnessing. Yeah, beware if you watch the documentary, you will see everything. Oh, they, wow. All the photos are there from the crime scene. I've seen them all. Wow. The children, each one of them, had been bludgeoned with either a shotgun's butt or its barrels, and so hard that it had bent the barrels in two places. Yeah, I was wondering how they, how they ended up bent. Now I kind of wish I didn't know. The blood in the living room was assumed to be cast off from the blow to one of the children running for their lives. The removal of the bodies took two hours. It was no way to spend a Sunday morning. Many of the officers had children themselves and would rather be with their families at church, other than dealing with the work of some ferociously angry demon. Mm. There were bloodstains evident all throughout the house, despite the killer's effort to clean up after himself. At yeah. Police continued to gather evidence. There was a lot more that we could have talked about here. We could have been much more graphic than we were, but uh, I'm not going to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Robert Raymond Cook claimed he saw nothing out of the ordinary when he had visited on Saturday. That wouldn't have been possible as the bloody scene in the bedroom was visible through the open door. Yeah. The home was locked and boarded up to prevent anyone from entering. Stetler residents were horrified that such a terrible thing could happen in their small town. Cook had acquired the services of a lawyer, David McNaughton, regarding his fraud charges. McNaughton was there when Sergeant Roach told Robert Raymond Cook, your father is dead and you're under arrest for murder. At that, Robert Cook yelled, no, not my father, not my father, and began to weep. He was told of the bodies being found at the home and that all had been brutally murdered. Cook behaved as though he couldn't believe they were gone. As I mentioned, he looked like James Dean. Perhaps he had the same acting talent because he seemed to have fooled his lawyer at least. Hmm. He was known to be a very practiced liar, but he'd never been violent before. That did stand out to some. Yep. How could this be possible? This good-looking young man sitting in the RCMP detachment had no history of prior violence. However, here he was, the only suspect in the murder of his entire family, all seven of them, including those kids. Cook denied any involvement of the massacre and was incredulous that he could be charged with the crime. Regardless, the bewildered Cook was charged with capital murder that Monday morning before a standing room only crowd in Stetler Courthouse. Directly after his arraignment, Cook gave his first statement of his whereabouts and what he had been doing leading up to and after the time of the murders. Again, he denied any knowledge of the murders. He claimed on the day after his release from prison, he collected $4,300 near Bowdoin, Alberta, that he'd hidden there prior to his previous incarceration. The money was from robberies he'd committed before. Mm -hmm. To help his father buy the garage in B.C., Robert claimed he'd given him $4,100 on Thursday night at 5108 52nd Street, keeping the rest as walk-around money. He said he gave his dad his blue prison suit as he had no nice clothes of his own. That's right, the same one stuffed under the mattress at the crime scene. Oh, uh, weird. Robert said Ray gave him the station wagon and his driver's license in exchange for the cash. And then Robert left for Jimmy Myalux in Edmonton at 10.30 p.m. This contradicted those other stories that he'd told Constable Braden and Roach about how he had dropped his parents off either at the bus stop in Edmonton or at the airport in Calgary. Which story was the real one? I'm inclined to go with neither. The cops questioning Cook didn't believe him. If he didn't kill his father, then who did? Cook, near tears, said he didn't know. From Rick Smallwood's documentary, did he have any enemies? He's not the kind to make enemies. He's too friendly, said Cook. Why would someone kill him? Cook says, I don't know. Did you black out Thursday night? And this is when he got really emotional. No, I didn't kill him. I don't give a shit what you say. Hmm. 
Robert Raymond Cook was then sent to what was called the Pinoca Mental Hospital for a 30-day psychiatric assessment. They wanted to determine his fitness to stand trial. Cook was placed in the maximum security wing of the hospital and couldn't go anywhere, even the washroom, without two burly attendants watching his every move. It's quite fascinating, all this, the how he's displaying a lot of emotion towards one of the victims, nothing towards the others. As Cook began to talk over the next few days, he didn't impress the psychiatric professionals with his professions of innocence or his weird emotional responses to the deaths of the seven members of his immediate family. Mm -hmm. He was flat, yeah. emotionally flat. Yeah, yeah. He was more interested in talking about cars, his Impala in particular. Cook claimed that someone who knew about the $4,100 could have done it for the money, if the money even exists, because it still hadn't turned up. Yeah, I, I am skeptical that it had, or you would have just used that money to buy the car. And what about the gun? No one had seen him with it. It didn't belong to the house. That is, as far as anyone could prove. Whose was it? Cook claimed he did not even know about the pit in the garage. How could he have placed his family somewhere he didn't know even existed? Oh, my. Yes, he didn't. Yeah, right? He used to watch his dad work all the exactly. time. Exactly. Even though he didn't spend a lot of time in his home afterward because he was always in jail. Yeah, but that's still, that's going to be something that was put in uh, while constructing the house, most likely. Or the garage, which was constructed after. Uh, Cook said he wanted to go to his family's funeral. This request was, of course, denied. Authorities aren't in the practice of sending alleged murderers to the funerals of their victims. On July 10th, 1959, Cook, made, uh, Cook followed through on his desire to be out for the burial of his parents and siblings. He slipped out through a window and ran off in the middle of the night, escaping from custody. Maximum security, my eye. Good gravy. Upon hearing that an alleged mass murderer had escaped, the residents in, ta in Alberta towns nearby were terrified. Some even picked up and left. Yeah, well, knowing that somebody who just murdered his own family uh, is on the prowl or on the loose in your hood, that, yeah, I could see booking it out of there. Cook stole a car and drove towards Stetler. The next day, Cook was spotted speeding past RCMP patrol officers on Highway 12. One officer shot at the vehicle emptying his entire clip before giving chase they saw the car crash spectacularly into a field ahead on a corner sounds dramatic the officers arrived at the scene of the crash guns drawn there was no sign of cook somehow he'd survived and run off holy shit a photo of the wreck shows a bullet hole through the driver's side windshield of the smashed car where cook's head should have been he got lucky jeez Cook stole another car, a Monarch, from a garage nearby. The search for Cook was huge. At least 200 officers plus others were looking for him. Hmm. On July 13th, after another tip from a local couple, the Monarch was found abandoned, covered with branches. Robert Raymond Cook was on the run for almost four full days. A farmer called police, having seen a man near his barn. Robert Cook was taken into custody with zero resistance near Bashaw, Alberta. He was later taken to Fort Saskatchewan, the same prison as Swift Runner, presumed Wendigo, was hanged 80 years before for killing and eating his entire family, and that's our episode 25. Yeah, another vile uh, person. In September, Cook was arraigned on the charge of capital murder against his father, the only charge he was to face in the matter. We're unsure why he wasn't charged with the other six, but one can assume as the mandatory sentence for capital murder is death at the time. Logic was you can only kill a guy once. Uh, uh, yeah. uh okay. <laughs> or maybe if he got off that one, they'd just charge him with another. Oh, perhaps that. Could be. Yeah. Cook pled not guilty in elected trial by judge and a jury of six. I didn't know that that was a thing. I'm not sure it still is. Yeah. Cook's trial began on November 30th, 1959, in Red Deer, Alberta. Without any eyewitnesses or confession, the gory evidence against Cook for the massacre was circumstantial, albeit very strongly. Bit by awful bit, the Crown presented the evidence of what police had found at 5108, 52nd Street. The Crown countered Robert's claim about having given the suit to his father, stating they believed he'd left it there in a guilty, frenzied haste to dispose of it as it was soaked in blood. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
The defense argued the suit had been on the bed during the time of the murder and was battered by blood when the, quote, real killer shot Mr. and Mrs. Cook. Hmm. The Crown countered again with, what about those five shotgun shells in the pocket? <laughs> there was that, yeah. The defense had no real answer at the time, but others have guessed this was done to frame Robert Raymond Cook. Yeah, no. A local woman who'd been doing her hair at the time said she heard two gunshots at 12, 10 a.m. in the morning coming in the direction of the Cook residence. This established the time that the shooting happened. Mm -hmm. So it was on that Friday morning. Yeah. Cook wasn't actually seen again until like seven in the morning. So mm. that gave seven hours to get to Edmonton. Yeah, I don't I don't know uh, the distance between these locations, but it sounds like, I know you can drive from Calgary to Edmonton in like three hours, I believe. Yeah, and it's like halfway between, so it's like yeah. an hour and a half. Cook sent a letter to his lawyer in which he claimed he was breaking into a dry cleaner in Edmonton at 2 a.m. on the morning of the murders with his prison buddy, Sonny Wilson. So I couldn't have committed that crime because I was committing another one. <laughs> he said he'd left Stetler at 10.30 that night, and he wouldn't have had any time to do the things that had been done, including the cleanup and moving the bodies. Cook said he got to Edmonton just after midnight, and the first person he saw was his buddy Sonny. Sonny convinced him to come and burglarize the dry cleaner with him, which he did. He had left his pal downtown at 4.30 a.m. after they had done the break and enter, and went to Myalux, where he slept in the car for a few hours before going inside. Okay. So still not able to account for all of his time. Yeah, yeah. Cook's story seemed to change a lot to fit the circumstances when he was confronted with evidence. Usually an indication of lying. Right. Even though Sonny Wilson's account was very close to Cook's, the Crown argued that the two men had concocted the story while in Fort Saskatchewan together prior to Cook's trial. Yeah, that'll happen. Sonny was in jail for just that crime. Hey, why don't you say you were with me? Yep, yep, exactly. Robert's story didn't stand up in a lot of ways, especially when it came to Ray in the garage. If Ray was going to BC to look for a garage to buy, or had bought one, he had no way of getting there. <laughs> he had no ID, uh, and yeah, like, uh, a wife and five kids with him. He had not been dropped off in Calgary. He had not been taken to a bus depot in Edmonton. He, his wife, and five children were dead in a pit in their garage. Yeah, that's, there's a lot of holes in... A bunch. In, in his logic there. There are a bunch of holes, but nothing has put Cook definitively at the scene. DNA. It's 1959. <sighs> Robert Cook's defense team of McNaughton and now Maine a more experienced trial lawyer, fought hard to explain away or discredit evidence. Yes, the suit was Robert's, but he claimed he'd given it to his father, as he had the red tie that Daisy had sent him in prison. The owner of the 60-year-old shotgun used in the crime was unknown. There was no evidence linking Cook to that weapon. Hmm. In fact, there was no evidence linking anyone to the shotgun. Anyone at all. Some people have speculated it was in the house and it was just unknown to the police or anybody else that it was there, but perhaps Robert knew it was there. Yep. Okay. Or it could have been something he had picked up on one of his other jobs. It wouldn't have been too difficult for a hardened criminal to acquire a shotgun. There were unidentified fingerprints at the scene, according to the defense. Whose were they? Okay. Huh? But, I mean, it's a house and there's kids and there's other kids. Friends. Exactly. Yeah. The Friday morning paper was missing. Who took it? Maybe the murders had happened then. Cook had an alibi that he was with Maya Luck on Friday morning. The paper boy was not questioned whether or not he'd dropped the paper off at all that Friday morning. So that was unknown. Yeah. Okay. But is the paper reasonable doubt? Uh, no. I don't know. Not in, not in my opinion. The Ross shirt. Whose was it? A man named Ross had been staying at the commercial hotel the same time as Cook. The man had not reported anything stolen and could not determine conclusively if it was his shirt. In fact, there were many shirts belonging to men named Ross whose marks closely resembled this one, but police did not do their due diligence ruling them all out. Mm. The shirt was not the same one that Robert had been given in prison. The other shirt was not recovered. Where was that? Robert couldn't account for it either. However, some believe that it was used as a rag for cleanup that ensued, 
But that's only speculation. They speculate he may have thrown it away you know, yeah, later yeah. on. Yeah. And where was this money? Was that $4,100 the real motive for the crime? A lot of other prisoners had been released at the same time. Robert admitted to bragging about his plans in the pen prior to his release. Well, wouldn't that make Robert the target? Not necessarily. Okay. Robert's Robert's a boxer. You don't want to mess with that guy. Wait until he gives it to his dad. If you got a shotgun, it doesn't matter if somebody's a boxer. <laughs> Maybe someone else he'd been released with had overheard him and committed the vile acts. I mean, it's a possibility, but yeah, no. But there's your reasonable doubt. You said that it's a possibility. That doesn't equal reasonable doubt. Because you could say you could say that to anything. Well, it's a possibility that OJ didn't do it. Cook testified for three full days himself. Wow. Yeah, he, he wanted to talk. He claimed that during his trip back to the house on Saturday afternoon is when he found the two suitcases and metal box that had been found in the trunk of the Impala. He was adamant that he had not had them with him on Thursday when he left. He said he thought his father had left them for him to bring to BC. The contents of the suitcases were essentially junk. They'd been used for storage in the Cook home. As well, the metal box had a lot of identifying papers inside it, report cards and such for the kids. Mm. To establish timeline, the defense called a witness. A Camrose police officer who'd stopped Cook on Saturday in the Impala on his way back to Stetler. Mm. The officer said yes, that he'd stop Cook at that time. And when he'd searched the car, he had seen the two suitcases. Okay. If this was true, then Cook was just proven a liar. The officer was asked if he was sure that these had been these exact suitcases. He restated that yes, they were the two suitcases. This would have been hours before Cook claimed to be in possession of them. He would have had to have taken them in the station wagon when he'd left the Cook home the last time, either Thursday night or, if guilty of the crime, Friday morning. Mm -hmm. Even the Crown was not aware of this detail. The defense's own witness had just sunk their case. <laughs> the jury came back after 92 minutes with a verdict of guilty. That's very quick. I don't know if verdicts were reached that quickly all the time back then, but that's quick. But this is even after Justice Greshock had given like a three-hour lecture to them, preparing them to go and deliberate. So the lecture was longer than the deliberation. Yeah. From Barbara Smith's Fatal Intentions, True Canadian Crime Stories, Justice Greshock then asked, Robert Cook, do you have anything to say? Cook said, all I have to say, sir, is that I'm not guilty. I couldn't have done this and I didn't do it. A hush fell over the courtroom. The judge continued, You shall be returned to the cells in Fort Saskatchewan on April 15th, 1960. You shall be taken from that place and hanged. May God have mercy on your soul. Close quote. Hmm. Gifford Maine, Cook's trial attorney, filed for a new trial based on his belief that some of the statements by Cook given to the police and given in evidence were prior to his being cautioned and should not have been allowed. The court agreed, and a new trial was ordered with a new judge and a new jury. No! Uh. The same evidence was given, minus the police evidence, mm -hmm. after a brief and legally contentious dissertation to the jury by the judge, they were sent off to consider Cook's guilt again. After only one half hour, the jury came back having unanimously reached a guilty verdict on the first ballot. Yeah, they were in quicker. For the second time, Robert Raymond Cook was sentenced to death for capital murder of his father. Still, though, like, again, what I don't understand not, not being charged with the other deaths. Is it just the simple fact of, of cost? It have to be a larger yes, trial probably. to be able, you know, mm, mm, sucks. While waiting to die, Cook wrote letters of appeal to everyone he could think of, including Prime Minister Diefenbaker. The Prime Minister was the final person who could commute a death sentence to life. Diefenbaker denied Cook's appeal. It was apparently some political reasons there. Mm. He was taken from his cell at 12.02 a.m. on November 15th, 1960. The trapdoor opened three minutes later, and Robert Raymond Cook 
was pronounced dead at 1218 in the room below. Hmm. I'm unsure why it took so long. Yeah. Uh, 1205 to 1218. Maybe they have a set time that they just leave the wait. I guess. To ensure death. Apparently it was unusual. Oh, okay. Robert Raymond Cook was to be Alberta's last man hanged. This case haunted many and some felt that justice had not been served. What say you, Scott? Yeah, I feel as if justice had been served. Uh, I don't know. You don't know, eh? Uh, I I don't because I wasn't there. Oh, but I thought you were <laughs> no. old enough. <sighs> Not even close. Yeah. But th- there were a lot of holes in what he told people. Granted, absolutely, but nothing definitively put him at the scene. Well, we're talking about the fifty. Well, it was the death in the fifties or early sixties? I don't. Recalled the time. 60, 1960, he was sentenced to death. Okay, so I. Like, or so he, the, the, 1960, he hanged. Okay, so the deaths took place uh, in the. Late 1959. 50s. So, I, I mean, clearly in that time, the forensic abilities differ dramatically mm-hmm. than what they have now. And so, no matter what, you're almost always going to have some potential doubt. Uh, but. Um, because you can't have, there's, we're used to definitives like DNA. We can definitively prove that your semen is there. You know, like we have these definitives yep. back then. It was very challenging unless there was a, a direct witness or something to have definitives. And so, uh, th- sure, there are some holes in the prosecution's case, but um, there's, I think there's given holes the, in both sides. Yeah, I think given uh, the skills and abilities of the time, I, I feel that, that that would have been, uh, I would have found that to be enough evidence and proof. Really? Because what other explanations are there? Well, the explanation that somebody else did it for that $4,100 that was missing. Yeah, but but the whole plot of how that $4,100 got to his father was preposterous. By the way, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, folks. I actually, Screw you, Milkbone. I, I actually do think he did it. <laughs> You're poking Poindexter. But, but I'm poking Poindexter for a reason. It's about that reasonable doubt. Absolutely beyond the shadow of a reasonable doubt can you say this person committed that crime? I don't know. Based on that evidence, knowing what I know today, and like you mentioned, it was it's DNA and all that kind of stuff. If they couldn't have found his DNA there, I mean, the DNA would have been on the suit anyway because he had given it to his father. Yeah, but even just like blood spatter evidence uh, has dramatic. There would have been a lot of other forensic skills they could have used outside of DNA. But I mean, uh, when it comes to reason, I don't believe in capital punishment period. I I am not a proponent of the death penalty. Uh, And so, you know, too many times innocent people have been put to death. And so I just, I wouldn't be able to find, uh, I wouldn't be able to support a death penalty, but I definitely find that he's guilty. Yeah, well, at that time you would have had to have supported the death penalty. Well, uh, thank God uh, I'm- You didn't have to do that. Thank God I'm only 44. The young, ripe old age of 44, and I wasn't around like you were for, I this, wasn't for around. this case. I wasn't, even, I wasn't even a twinkle in anybody's eye. Yeah. I'm my, pretty, my mother would have been 12? I'm pretty sure you were on the jury. <sighs> pretty confident about that. All right. Well, that's it for Scott's comments on that. <laughs> and on a high note. And on a high note. We're going to kick you in the nuts. Yeah, somebody asked it. That was a tough one for me to write, uh, especially seeing the photos that oh. I, I had to see. Oh, I would imagine. Uh, that I cannot not unsee. Yeah. I abhor murder, period, anybody. But as we've talked about umpteen times, children specifically just destroy me. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. Heavy. Yeah. 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 Heavy stuff. Before we go... We want to lighten the mood a bit. Oh, let's do that. And give some shout outs to our Patreon patrons. Uh, First up, we have a good egg from the Yumber Yard, Julie Funfer. And she has an umlaut over the U in her last name. So I'm pronouncing Funfer because I think that is how it's pronounced. Two two great uh, pronounced Funfer and umlaut. That's great. She's from Victoria. Sweet. Just across the little 
pond over well, there. Thank you very much, Julie. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly. If not, Victoria's not that far. You can come and give Mike a kick in the junk. <laughs> or you could do that. Tanya Todd from Paris, Ontario. I've met Tanya twice, and she is a very active Yumber Yard Good Egg. She's totes a great She's egg. She's totes a great egg. She has been sending people little treat packages from Canada. Uh, that is so awesome. Yeah, she's really great. And if she's met you twice and is still a listener, like that, she's great. It's got to be. She is absolutely she's a, saint. a solid individual. Right? You are solid. Yeah. I'm held captive. Ms. Todd. I, I'm here as a as, as Scott as lives in the closet. I do, not voluntarily. I'm on a chain right now. He only lets me out for this podcast. Help. <laughs> also, another good egg from the Yumber Yard has subscribed to our Patreon, and that is Autumn from Black Falls, Alberta. Oh, hey, Autumn. Autumn is also my favorite season and, yeah. a, and yeah. a lovely name. It really is. I, I've got to support you on that one. Chelsea Tupper. Also a great name. She is from the city I was born in, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Oh, welcome, Chelsea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Kelly, another supporter, is from Emporia, Kansas. Oh, wow. I didn't know uh, there was an Emporia in Kansas. But there's probably a lot of places in Kansas I don't know about. That's, so. that's right. But welcome, Kelly. And I, I know. Uh, Thank uh, you, Kelly. Uh, I know uh, Toto. With uh, Dorothy. Yeah, exactly. So there's that. Lauren, or Lil Buckaroo. <laughs> From Farmington, Connecticut. Thank you very much, Lauren. Welcome, little, or thank you, little buckaroo. <laughs> I know you're saying welcome instead of thank you. I don't know what that's. Yeah, I don't know. It's, I, I'm tired, man. I, I did things today. Scott did stuff. Yeah, so I'm all, I'm all tuckered out for this. Our last shout out is Tyler Rempel from Calgary, Alberta. And this one's a bit of a special one. Yeah, absolutely is. His great aunt and great uncle were Lyle and Marie McCann. They are the couple from Edmonton from our episode 37 who were murdered by punch me face Travis Edward Vader. Yeah, that piece of human garbage. Yeah, I, I, I have such a hard time with that one. Yeah, well, they were such good, innocent people. Absolutely. They remind me a lot of my own parents. I can't imagine what it was like for that family to have their older relatives just torn away from them while they were supposed to be enjoying themselves. Um, Tyler uh, mentioned that uh, he really liked the episode and he shared it with his family and they really liked it. Which just means the world, honestly. Like that, that's, you, you don't know how family's going to react. The fact that, the, that a member of that family is now a patron too for our show, like really means a lot to us. I, I mean, that's such a powerful reward for us. Just, just the, the knowledge uh, that we've positively. They, yes. Yeah. 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 It, it's, it's pretty awesome. So uh, I'm going to say welcome just because I want to be consistent. So welcome, uh, Tyler. Rumble. And thank you. And, and thank you. Thanks so much to our patrons, past and present. I'm feeling a little misty after that one. For your pledges, we really appreciate your support of the show. Absolutely. If you want to help support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash dark poutine or for a one-time support, you can send us some donut money via pay. pay PayPal. I said PayPal again. PayPal. That's a, that's a no, different site. PayPal yeah, at P our email, darkpoutinepodcast.com. Don't go to PayPal. Don't do it. <laughs> I can't imagine what's there. <laughs> I don't even want to. I suspect we're going to find out, oh, Mike. No. PayPal.com. No, unpleasant. Yep. Check out our website, www.darkpoutine.com, for show notes and other cool stuff. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Dark Poutine. Obviously, keep telling your friends about us because our numbers keep going up and up and up. Did you mean to say Instagram? Insta did I say Instagram? You did. You did. You're on fire today. So, PayPal and Instagram. <laughs> Don't go there either. Don't go there. <laughs> Especially fun is our closed group, The Umber Yard. Yes. Yumber Yardians. We are active in there. You can meet us and our other cool listeners. Yep. You can subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast directory like iTunes Podcast, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, or Spotify. Spotify. So that's it for this week. <sighs> it was a daunting 
story to tell. It totally was. But we told it. We did. And we will be back next time with another one. Yes, we shall. So don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Uh, Bye-bye. Hi, it's Shauna, and I might be a bad parent because my kids think french fries are vegetables. Hey, it's Ryan, and I might be a bad parent because I went out for wings when my wife was in the hospital after giving birth. Johnny here. I might be a bad parent because in my house, the tooth fairy gives pocket change. But we're not alone. Len emailed us and said his six-year-old daughter's Tarzan moment going from love seat to lazy boy by curtains made him more proud than any dance (laughs) recital. (laughs) And Andy left his two-year-old at the rink. All right, guys, I'm sure we're not alone. Like Andy's kid. For stories and confessions like this, make sure you check out our podcast. It's called Bad Parents, and it's available wherever you get your podcasts. I left a glove at the rink.